All right, before we get going here, if you're not already a subscriber, click the button and ring the bell so you don't miss anything. Thanks. Everybody, thanks for joining me on a Wednesday, a hot summer day here where I am. I hope it's not as hot where you are, but what are we going to do? It's late July. Um, so this is a cool episode, a little bit of a departure from normal themes. Uh, we're kind of focusing on the ground combat element today. But before I bring on Jack, uh, let's go over a little bit of uh, channel admin here. The first thing I wanted to put out to everybody is I just heard from the Naval Institute Press, the, the publisher of the, the Punk Trilogy, and they told me they were wandering around Beach Hall over there, the, their headquarters on the Naval Academy grounds, and they found a box of the bundle, the hard cover three book set that they did as a special edition back when the books were republished. Uh, it's been about two years now since the, the trilogy was republished. So these are special edition hard covers. Each one is signed by me and there are limited quantities. So if you go to that link and if you look in the channel description, uh, that URL is there. And then at checkout, use the discount code PUNKYT, P-U-N-K-Y-T, all caps. You get 25% off the bundle. So time flies. It's not too long until it's the holidays. Um, think of the aviation aficionados on your gift list and how they might like uh, the, the trilogy. And when they're gone, they're gone. And I thought that time had already passed, and apparently uh, it, it had not. So uh, take advantage of the fact that the Naval Institute Press has editions of the, the bundle still in stock, very limited uh, number. So check that out. The other thing uh, in terms of where I'm going to be and uh, places that we'll go. So a couple of weeks ago, we had Moochapalooza here in Annapolis. It was a fantastic get together of patrons, subscribers, and friends. So we had patrons come from as far away as Mexico and upstate New York. And we had some subscribers who came, uh, particularly there's some law enforcement guys that came from Pittsburgh and again, upstate New York and traveled down to Annapolis. And it really did my heart good. And they had copies of the Punks trilogy that they wanted me to sign or other mementos. I actually signed a Tomcat Natops from one guy named Phil. And so a really fun gathering. So I want to do Moochapaloozas across the country. We've done one in San Diego. Um, we'll do others wherever we happen to be. Reno, Pensacola, Virginia Beach. Uh, but our signature one is the one that happens every summer in Annapolis. Uh, so stay tuned for that. If you can make it to the next one, uh, I would love to see you. But this was a fantastic gathering. Thanks to everyone who came out. It was the debut of my new band, Danger Boy. Uh, and it was really a, a, a fun event. So the next thing on the calendar in terms of the tour schedule is Tailhook. So we will be out at Tailhook in Reno, Nevada. The dates of the convention in Reno, it's at the Nugget in Reno, and this is August 24th, 25th, and 26th are the dates. Got a booth there. Um, we'll be doing some meet and greets in the lobby of the Nugget and some other fun things. So if you live in the greater Reno Sparks area, I would love to meet you in person. So please come see us on August 25th. 26th and 27th. We have a lot of giveaways at the booth and uh, select folks will be walking away with a, with a channel t-shirt, which we've had specially designed for hook. And then the last event is the Oceana air show. So this is September. Let me make sure I get the dates, right? Um, 15th, 16th and 17th in Virginia Beach at the Naval Air Station Oceana. It's their annual air show. The Blue Angels will be performing. So we're taking the tour of RV 
down there. Hoser is going to join me. Virus might be there. Um, and we're going to be shooting Buku content, uh, doing a lot of interviews with Amanda Lee, the female Blue Angel, with Air Lant, uh, the Admiral, the two star who's in charge of uh, the Naval Air Forces Atlantic, kind of the uh, exo of the Air Boss. And the seal of NAS Oceana, the seal of the Super Hornet Rag. There's a reception at the Officers Club on Friday evening that we'll be attending. Lots of other things. So if you're attending the Oceana Air Show, or if you were thinking about it, please come see us. We'll be right there on the flight line. And again, we'll have giveaways and other things happening. Uh, like I said, Kevin Miller Hoser will be joining me. He'll be signing copies of his Raven One series and the Silver Waterfall and some other things. So uh, we would love to see you guys there. And then later this year, we'll be going to Pensacola for the Blue Angels homecoming show and be doing some stuff with Hoser at the Naval Aviation, Naval Aviation Museum down there. So uh, really excited to get out of the attic and uh, get out there and, and, and meet folks in person. Like I said, we just had a fantastic time at Mucha Palooza. Looking forward to Hook coming up very fast and then Oceana. So, all right. Um, I haven't done a live stream for a while. In fact, the last one was my safety stand down uh, review some weeks ago. Um, I'd like to do them more often. So I wanted to use this opportunity uh, with Jack Murphy to go ahead and do, do this in a live stream format. Um, I want to address questions, but as I've said before during live streams, uh, I'm kind of a one-armed paper hanger, so uh, please be patient. Uh, we'll we'll try to get to the, the relevant questions and get them fused into the dialogue. But let me go ahead and bring... Oh, before I bring Jack in, let me just thank uh, one of my patrons and, and subscribers, Benny Perez, for sending me this very cool Corsair, Korean War era Corsair. He put it on a cool stand with, uh, with wings and a label. It's beautiful stuff. I got this. Uh, he mailed this to me. So, Benny, thanks very much for for that uh, very cool model. It it has a place of honor on the other side of the studio here. So, thanks very much. I I, I love receiving stuff from channel fans, and 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 you know, thanks very much for the effort. I know this particularly is a gorgeous model, um, made with with very detailed accuracy. So, thanks again, Benny. All right. So let's bring my guest aboard. Jack, good to see you. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm good, Ward. Good to see you, man. So Jack and I go way back, as we described in a recent episode of his podcast slash YouTube channel. So I was on, what was it, Jack, like a month ago or more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and so this was a wide ranging discussion that went all kinds of places um, and I imagine this episode may, may do the same, but this is the team house, both YouTube channel and podcast. I highly recommend you subscribe and check it out. They have on special operators, they have influencers, they have all kinds of stuff. And these discussions go deep on myriad topics, uh, is it a weekly, Jack? How often do you guys uh, it's, put up It's weekly stuff? or bi-weekly. I mean, every Friday we're live at 8 p.m., but we do a, a lot, quite a few episodes on Tuesdays and Wednesdays as well nowadays. Okay. So Jack and I go way back, and we'll talk about how we know each other. Um, and it's not through active duty circles, uh, but circles that covered the active duty beat as military journalists. So we'll talk about that, the early days, the Wild West days of military <laughs> digital media. But before we get into that, I want to talk about Jack's time as a U.S. Army Ranger and Sniper. So, Jack, you were born and raised in New York? Yeah, yeah. I uh, was born in Sleepy Hollow, New York, and lived there uh, for a while. Then I went to high school in a town a little further north uh, called North Salem, graduated from high school there. So I, gr I grew up in, in Westchester County, New York. Okay. And so not unlike some other folks that we know, when you witnessed the horrors of 9-11 and you were already kind of thinking of maybe mm -hmm. you'd want to join the military, but this 
definitely motivated you to go visit the recruiter's office, starting with the Marine Corps, ironically <laughs> enough, and what happened with those guys. Yeah, I mean, the let's see. So I was still in high school, and I went to go talk to the Marine Corps recruiter because, I mean, hey, the Marines are the place to be, right? Um, and uh, I wanted to be Marine infantry. Like, that's it, right? And the Marine recruiter, uh, he kind of like did something kind of underhanded, I felt, even as a, as a teenager. I mean, he, he told me I had one day to sign up. And if I didn't sign up right now, he wouldn't be able to get me in an infantry slot, which I mean, we can both kick back and laugh at that, thinking that the Marines or, or, or the Army would ever run out of infantry slots is just hilarious. But um, that was that little like uh, sleight of hand game he was playing there and uh it didn't give me a very good feeling so i went down the hallway and talked to the army and uh see what they have going on and uh you know the rangers was was you know the next thing that was the elite infantry that that the army has so your your spidey sense went off when this guy's giving you the hard sell as you put it and yeah and, which was uh, weird why did why did he try to hard sell me i was already sold yeah well, that's a lesson in sales, right? Yeah, yeah. Don't sell something that's already sold for all of you fledgling sales pre people out there. Um, but uh, so you you talk to the Army recruiter and, and he mentions Rangers. So I, I want to clear it up for my audience who naturally self-select uh, as interested in, in aviation, which is the theme of my channel. Um, so when you say Rangers, like... I'm a ranger or they have a ranger tab. That means a whole bunch of things. And, and, you, and so you got to kind of drill down. Okay. Ranger, but you know, you, sorry, word, are you still there? Did I lose you, Jack? Yeah. Yeah. Just for okay. a second. You're yeah. back. Uh, so, you, you want me to continue? Yeah. So just talk to us about, um, sure. The, the, the various forms of Rangers and your progression through uh, yeah, RIP and ultimately becoming a, a full up Ranger assigned to a Ranger battalion. Sure. So, yeah, the Army makes this like way, way needlessly complicated. Um, and there's a lot of misconceptions or misunderstandings amongst the public, which I understand because, again, the, the military <laughs> makes it incredibly confusing. So. Within the Army, there is a unit, uh, a, an actual deployable combat unit, uh, a special operations unit called the 75th Ranger Regiment. Um, and so the Ranger Regiment consists of 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, and 3rd Battalion and the regimental headquarters. 1st Battalion is in Savannah, Georgia. 2nd Battalion is at uh, JBLM, Fort Lewis in Washington. And then 3rd Battalion, where I was stationed, is at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, which is also where the regimental headquarters is. Um, and so this is, again, this is a elite infantry, airborne infantry unit. Um, they now um, build themselves as America's premier raid force. Uh, they conduct raids, airfield seizures, um, a number of other different tasks. Um, but at the end of the day, they are a elite infantry unit. Uh, now, the Army also has a school, um, a school that falls under TRADOC, the training uh, command, um, so it is not a deployable unit it is simply a training course or school located in the United States called Ranger School. So Ranger School is a leadership uh, and tactical training course that takes place over the course of two months in uh, Georgia and in Florida. And it is open to people all over the army. Anyone in the army can apply, including, you know, something that has changed in recent years is women can also apply to Ranger School. Uh, and so the course really subjects students to a lot of sleep deprivation and food deprivation and gets you cold, tired, exhausted, and puts you in leadership positions where you have to lead infantry operations, patrols out in the woods. And um, now the, the connection between the Ranger Regiment and Ranger School is that if you serve in the Ranger Regiment and to have any sort of leadership position there, you also have to be a graduate of Ranger School. 
But other than that, these are two totally separate things. So the Ranger tab that you get for graduating from Ranger school is one thing. The Ranger scroll that people assign to the 75th Ranger Regiment, uh, denoting that they are assigned to a Ranger combat unit, are two totally different things. Um, and somebody can have a Ranger tab and be a you know chemical officer or an air defense NCO. Uh, anybody can have a Ranger. Not to say that I'm not trying to put it down. I'm just saying that anyone in the army can attend ranger school and have a ranger tab and people look at that and say, well, that's a ranger. And so the army has kind of shot itself in the foot because the army itself doesn't necessarily know how to define a ranger. Right. And uh, it, it comes out. I feel like I write this article once a year um, because inevitably there is a political candidate who is calling themselves a ranger. And then the debate breaks out. Are they really a ranger? And well, at some to some extent, it does from the public's per, uh, point of view, it becomes a distinction without a difference. Like if I, if you explain everything I just said to you know the average voter, they're like, "Huh, okay, <laughs> so what?" <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I this I'm trying to think what the analogy would be in fighter aviation, and and so I, I think a rough analogy would be Top Gun. Right? Have you been to Top Gun? And so now because Top Gun reaches every squadron that rolls through Fallon, every aviator will be in briefs and debriefs and fly against Top Gun. So arguably you could say, yeah, I've, I've worked with Top Gun. I've, I'm, I'm a Top Gun guy. Uh, but that's not having gone through the strike fighter weapons training instructor full up syllabus or actually being an instructor at Top Gun. Right. So. If I go to ranger school because having earned the tab is is beneficial on my record when I come up for promotion, right, which is almost mandatory, right, on the officer side. If you want to be upwardly mobile past, say, major, you have to have gone through ranger school as an infantry officer. Is that would you say that that's true? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's in the ballpark. You know, the the SEALs did it a lot better. You know, a SEAL is a SEAL. You either have you either have your trident or you don't, and even their JSOC guys are also seals. So I mean, it's it's much simpler by comparison to the army, and and then there's a whole other conversation about special forces, which is also like completely misunderstood by a lot of people. So I have a cool picture of you and your mom. Yeah, that was um. So this was when I graduated from the Ranger Indoctrination Program. So that's the selection course to become a member of the 75th Ranger Regiment. And at that ceremony, you were, you know, awarded that uh, khaki beret, uh, which is the distinctive headgear of the Ranger Regiment. Um, and now uh, RIP does not exist anymore. It's now called RASP, the Ranger Assessment and Selection Program. Uh, the course I went through was three weeks long, and now I believe it's eight weeks long. So the guys receive a lot more training um, than, than I did when I graduated in 2002. So you had some challenges, let's put it. Uh, oh, yeah. It was going through RIP or through through Ranger School itself. Well, both. <laughs> okay. Well, talk to us about some of that, because I think the fact you made it through in the face of, you know, falling along the way is, is you know, speaks to your motivation and character. So talk to us about, for instance, the 12-mile march that you, you couldn't keep up yeah, and with medical and, and different things like that. And, and, and how you were kind of uh, they threatened to throw you out of the, the course and, and you stuck with it. Yeah. Um, so there's a uh, 12 mile road march in, in is a part of RIP. It's like a forced road march. It's uh, I mean, the road march, of course, 12 mile road march is just a, a common infantry training event. Um, and I was, you know, 19 at the time, I was in pretty good shape and I, I felt that I should not have any big problem, uh, accomplishing this thing. Um, but I, I found myself falling out of the road march. Um, and then there was a retest and I also fell out of that and I, I felt terrible about it and very frustrated because it's like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? Uh, why can't I do something I know I should be able to do? Um, and, uh, <laughs> I, I went to see the, uh, medics at the, the troop medical clinic down the street and they looked at me and they said, well, yeah, half of your lungs is like halfway filled with fluid. Like you're sick as hell. <laughs> it's like, okay, no wonder why I couldn't keep up. So they wanted to put me on a week's worth of antibiotics, 
but I would have have, had to recycle the course. I mean, it was starting up on Monday and it was like, that was like three or four days from that point. So I was like, Hey, I got to be back in the course and I can't be on any prescription drugs when I start. So they gave me like this, (laughs) like three day crash course on antibiotics, uh, and, uh, pounded those down. And yeah, so it was like three or four days later, restarted rip. And, um, that time went right through the course. Um, uh, they actually did a release road march and I ran the entire thing and, uh, I, I came in first in, uh, my class. So, I mean, I definitely wanted to be there and wanted to do it. And, um, but I mean, that's the thing about the army. These are character building experiences and the military does give you opportunities to try again, to recycle, to try to get your act together, um, and fix whatever you did the first time. And, um, yeah, I mean, those are in retrospect, as much as it sucked at the time, I mean, they're, they're good experiences or good character building experiences, I think. Yeah, that's a good way to, to put it. Um, so you, you roll to uh, an operational unit. Uh, talk to us about your initial experiences downrange. Sure. So I got assigned to 3rd Ranger Battalion right there uh, at uh, Fort Benning. Uh, was assigned to ACO. Uh, the guys had just come back from Iraq, from the invasion of Iraq. I was actually in RIP when the invasion happened. And um, through talking to some people there, um, I actually had the opportunity to go to sniper section. Um, well, I went to ranger school first and, and passed that. And then when I got back from that, um, my unit was deployed to Afghanistan at that time. So I didn't I, I missed out on that first deployment because I was in ranger school and uh, went over to sniper section, uh, then went to sniper school. And so my first deployment was to Afghanistan in the winter of 2004. So yeah, that's a, that's a shot from a uh, castle uh, on the Pakistan border is up on top of a hill. And that was sort of a, a border control point. Um, so I was uh, part of a two-man sniper element attached to Charlie Company of 3rd Ranger Battalion. Uh, We were also there with the battalion recon team, which you see in that picture right there. Um, It was their first deployment um, that, you know, there was a regimental reconnaissance detachment, which was getting sucked up into other jobs. So each battalion had to stand up their own recce section. And uh, that's what you're seeing here. I mean, I'm the guy uh, second or third from the right uh, without the, um, you know, just standing there with a pistol, the guy wearing the Brown Pacol and the Brown beard. Here's something interesting. That's, uh, his name's Paul Shari. And he is like one of the leading experts on military artificial intelligence. Now he's written two books on it. Um, so really smart guy, really good guy. And I mean, this whole group you see here in the picture was a really good group of guys to work with. Well, here, I got to show you my Pacol shot from my time in uh, as an embedded journalist in, in Afghanistan. That's a cool hat. That's, you know, in case people don't know, the hat that we're wearing in those in those photos is called a Pakul. It's sort of a native Afghan hat, right? Um, so anyway. Yeah, so uh, let's see. That first deployment um, did a lot of sniper overwatch for Charlie Company missions, um, did some support for the recce missions, um, did some aerial platform support, uh, from helicopters again, for the guys who were on the ground. Um, it was not a super intense deployment. Uh, this was the winter of 2004. So the insurgency in Afghanistan had not kicked into high gear. Um, we probably actioned like 25 targets or something during that three month deployment. Um, and that's, um, I'm sitting on the side of a little bird there prior to a operation. And you can see I'm wearing like a heavy Columbia winter jacket because it was pretty cold <laughs> and you're up on, uh, on a helicopter flying around. Um, and that, so that was, did a- you, so during the op, would you sit outside like that and, yeah, just, hover like that. and you just shoot, shoot down at, at targets on the ground? Mm, yeah, just like that. I mean, I didn't shoot at any targets on that operation. Um, we did in training beforehand. Um, but thankfully there were, you know, no shots fired on that target, but I mean, sitting up there at night, um, looking through that night vision scope and, um, you know, seeing the Charlie company guys roll up on the target and their Humvees. And then there's another little bird with my sniper partner on it. And they saw some movement in the compound below. And I mean, it's just one of those really surreal moments to reflect back on the little bird did like a dive bomber run right down into the courtyard of that compound. And then like, 
you know, arced upwards at the last moment and just rotor washed out like the entire courtyard. And they did that as like a show of force to keep the, uh, you know, enemy or their suspected enemy's head down as the Charlie company guys were rolling up in their Humvees. And then the little bird just peels right off and goes back to doing overwatch. And, you know, the, the Charlie company Rangers made entry and secured the compound. Well, here's another picture of you back at, you know, in garrison with a little bird, just in, in the event, people don't know what a little bird is it's super agile helicopter. The, the guys who fly them are incredibly talented um and and so you know if you uh see black hawk down or any other mm -hmm. of those sorts of uh you can see what the little birds are capable of that's makes them more agile and and uh nimble say than a black hawk um certainly than an h-47 so a uh, cool cool airplane and this that was in um that was in fort campbell during a training exercise and you can see the the boom above my head there that's for attaching a fast rope um, so you can fast rope out of the helicopter onto a rooftop if you need to. Um, this is the MH model that is designed for ferrying soldiers around, operators, rangers, whoever. Um, there's also an AH model, uh, which um, is equipped with, uh, you know, rocket pods and, uh, you know, mini guns and can actually do, you know, gun runs to support, you know, guys on the ground. So here's another cool, pack cool shot. Um, this looks like, Obviously, east uh, uh, part of the country, very mountainous. Where was this taken? This was south um, on the Pakistan border during a reconnaissance mission. Um, and yeah, it's up up in the mountains, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So I know you operated out of FOB Salerno. I went through Salerno during my embed in 2010. Um, is that where you were based during this? this yes. Uh, uh, okay. Yep, yep. That was at Fob Salerno, uh, 2004. So what I remember about Fob Salerno, obviously you landed commercially in Kabul, some third party airlines, um, so Safri Air or something. And then we, they pushed us up to Bagram. Every, every road goes through Bagram, right? And then the PAOs there ask you like, what level of ride do you want to take you know and, and me and my managing editor editor christian low were like hey we want to go all the way so they're like, okay and they push us out to salerno and so the first thing we notice when we land is the runway is gravel right <laughs> it's not a hard surface runway yeah yeah you know? you're right and then from there you go to places where there's no runway there's a dirt lz right this is where you get to the combat outpost but uh salerno as you said was right on the border in Paktika province uh, with Pakistan. And it was, a, this was a hot area, right? A lot going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this was actually down on the border of its, itself, you know, which is a kind of perilous drive. Um, I don't think we, we took Hiluxes down there. I don't think you could even get Humvees through some of those mountain passes that we went through. They look like they had been dynamited out, um, you know, sometime in the past. So what year was that? Deployment. That was 04, 04 okay. and then into 05. Um, so what are, what were some of the highlights, lowlights? What do you remember off the top of your head in terms of uh, kinetic ops and, and stuff? And I, I, I mean, a lot, um, you know, the doing the sniper overwatch for direct action missions was pretty interesting. Um, moving around town at night and in, in, in uh, Kaust, was interesting. Um, some of those aerial platform missions I was telling you about were, were fascinating and fun. Um, I was also involved in a friendly fire incident uh, that you see in that, in that picture you had just shown where up in the mountains um, that was taken maybe a few hours before that, that incident took place. Um, and there's a whole complicated backstory that goes into that. Um, but I mean, there's a whole series of, of things that went wrong that day. And so, yeah, it, it was, thank God. I mean, nobody was, was killed in that, in that event, but I mean, that's one of those moments that, you know, kind of comes to define your life in a, in a certain way. Yeah. No. So when you say friendly fire, of course, Pat Tillman comes to mind. Well, um, interestingly, that operation was to do a reconnaissance mission for the person who supposedly planned the Pat Tillman ambush. Okay. So it almost happened uh, again, right? Um, yeah. So um, that 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 
coincidence is kind of eerie. It right? is. Um, so you get back from that that deployment. Uh, then then what happened? Um, let's see. Came back from that deployment um, and came back. Was training. Um, <laughs> had a bit of a falling out with my platoon sergeant. Although we we shook hands. We we were we were adults about it. Um, and ironically, so he sent me, uh, to first platoon in alpha company, uh, where I was a gun team leader, um, on a, in weapons squad, which was a, an awesome, awesome job. It was, it was great. Um, but that same platoon sergeant, uh, he came to be my new platoon sergeant. He followed me <laughs> shortly thereafter. So he was my platoon sergeant twice. Um, his name was Jared Van Alice, um, pretty, uh, you know, impressive guy. Um, I had a, a kind of a complicated relationship with him, but, you know, again, I think we both tried to be adults about it and work together. And, you know, in retrospect, he gave me a second chance in, in, in a huge way in, in a unit where you don't get many second chances. Um, so I'm grateful to him for that. Um, you know, and, and if I'm speaking about him in the past tense, it's because, well, here, here's to, again, to take it full circle. I mean, Jared, went on to join Delta Force uh, as an operator, and he himself was killed in a friendly fire incident in Afghanistan um, in 2010. Um, yeah, not good. Um, so you spent time both in, as you've described, Afghanistan and Iraq. How, how would you compare and contrast those two landscapes, the, the nature of those two conflicts that were going on in parallel? Yeah, kind of, kind of night and day from my perspective. Um, bouncing from Afghanistan in 05 to uh, that winter of 05 to Iraq in the summer of 05, um, where Afghanistan, I mean, very brutal terrain, long distance movements, um, targets difficult to acquire. Um, Iraq was uh, operating, you know, largely in an urban environment. We were doing what was called at the time time sensitive targets. So, there was just this flood of um, mostly signals intelligence that was coming into us. Um, and we are launching on targets one, two, three times a day, um, you know, hitting targets during periods of daylight, periods of darkness, um, going to follow on targets afterwards. Um, it, it was just, uh, it was a frantic three months of just rolling outside the wire all day and night. So you, you have this, this image of you in a vehicle that was one of your duties. What, what are we seeing here? So this is uh, myself sitting inside a striker armored vehicle, eight wheeled armored vehicle, armored personnel carrier. Um, and th that, that was the primary way that we got around um, driving them around. And one of the positions I had in, in addition to being a gun team leader, you know, when we did helicopter missions called halves helicopter assault force, um, you know, I was just sort of a, you know, dismounted um, gun team leader. Uh, and then when we were doing these other operations, weapon squad was the ones that were um, manning and crewing and driving the strikers. So our privates were driving, they were manning the uh, 50 cal RWS, the remote weapon system. And then me and uh, my the other team leader, um, you know, we were working as what's called the TC, uh, which I believe comes from the term tank commander, actually, um, or tactical commander. And you're, you're just the guy who's kind of like the team leader of the striker that's telling the driver where to go and what to do and telling the machine gunner what to look at and what to shoot at uh, and all of that. Um, and I mean, it, it, again, it got quite hectic at times. I had a uh, Panasonic tough book up there. And when I was the lead, I was the lead vehicle, um, you know, for a lot of these operations. So I'd have the the route up in the computer uh, with a little hockey puck GPS, um, keeping track of our movements and have to, you know, navigate our way to the target. Um, sometimes, you know, we'd have follow on targets and I'm listening into the radio to the, get the grids and then plug it into the Panasonic tough book and then plot the next route to the next target. Um, and some, sometimes the targets were coming at us so rapidly that we were just winging it. So after a couple of rotations and, and, uh, you know, some of what you did was hearts and minds stuff, you know, dismounted patrols, uh, working with the local villagers, sitting down with school kids. 
Uh, well, that was later in, in, in Special Forces. Okay. Um, so let's then t- take us to that that phase of, of your, your career then. Sure, sure. what so, I want to get is sort of a broad sort of yeah. retrospective of, of your sense of, of these, these wars, which informs Chapter 2, right? Um, so um, before you went to Special Forces, though, mm-hmm. um, anything else – that happened that was noteworthy that, that, you know, kinetic stuff or other sort of, uh, you know, the, the atmospheres of war, the surprise shocked, um, the kind of thing that you just can't prepare for. I mean, there's so many things that happened during such crammed into such a short time span. Um, it, it's very kind of uh, surreal to kind of like reflect back on the sights, the smells moving through these little villages, creeping around under night vision, um quite a few firefights we got into on that deployment um times we were getting shot at times we shot insurgents uh (laughs) frags going back and forth um there's one incident where uh we came up under an overpass and some insurgents threw hand grenades down on top of us um and got inside Uh, there was three vehicles in that particular convoy i was in the lead the guys in the trail, the trail vehicle, uh, one of the grenades actually went down into it, injured a bunch of rangers that we had to rush to the uh, field hospital in Missoul. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but I, I mean, it, it, was, it was just so frantic and so the, the pace of operations was just so quick. Um, so what's the, what the you just described, uh, you know, a, a, a harrowing uh, event in, a, in just another day in your life on that that deployment um what was morale like did you have a sense that of winning um or did it seem futile um did the tasking make sense in terms of the progression over the course of weeks and months or was it just sort of a scattergram uh how did you feel uh over the course Mm. of that that particular deployment you know i i think that um morale was rather high at the time because it felt like the ranger regiment was finally being taken off the leash and we were being, I I mean, speaking for myself and I I suspect a lot of my teammates would probably agree that like we were reaching, we felt like our full potential uh, as far as what we were able to do operationally. I mean, we were being challenged and we were, I mean, by the end of that deployment, don't get me wrong. I think we were all exhausted. I mean, I know I was, I was pretty fried by the end of that. Um, but it, it, it felt good to know that we were being used to the utmost of our abilities, if that makes sense. Um, as far as like the, the tactical or strategic picture, like when you are a soldier in a tactical environment like that, it feels a lot like you're winning um, because you're actioning these targets every day. And we were pulling a lot of HVTs, high value targets off of these compounds. I mean, we hit a lot of dry holes, don't get me wrong, but we also captured and killed a lot of high value targets. And when you're a soldier operating in that tactical environment, it really does feel like you're winning. Um, But now in retrospect, I mean, here we are, uh, you know, uh, well over a decade later, you look back on it and you realize that, you know, yes, we were, you know, being tactically successful, but so what? I mean, we were strategically a failure. Uh, we lost the war. I am for in so many ways. I mean, you, you have to look back on that and critically ask yourself, I mean, what was it for? And I think that our tactical success is, you know, worse. They, they were effective at putting the enemy on their heels, right? Like there's supposedly this insurgency, this Iraqi civil war that was kicking America's ass. Well, no, actually we kicked their ass. And um, by the time you get to like 2009, 2010, I mean, the entity that we called Al Qaeda in Iraq was like pretty much done. I mean, they were kind of defunct as an organization. Um, And into that void, what should have flowed was the Iraqi government aided and assisted by the United States government. Um, But somewhere around uh, as far as that piece of the Iraq war, things fell through. I mean, it did not turn out the way that any of us wanted. it. So what, what year are we talking about? at this point the operations that i'm describing yeah, in range yeah. of Battalion was 2005 the summer of 2005 okay so this is the height of sectarian violence yeah um, around right? there. this is before the end bar awakening and and the mm-hmm. petraeus yep. strategy um and, and so forth so that that was a a challenging time to be in iraq to put it mildly 
Yeah, yeah, it, it absolutely was. Yeah. So it's the way you describe it is the way I believe the unit I was embedded with in in there was Task Force Rockets on part of the 101st Airborne in Paktika province in 2010. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not that you're ignorant of the strategic, but you're focused locally. And for you, it's a dismounted patrol and it's engagement with the elders. In fact, you have a picture here. Let me see if I can bring it up uh, of you sitting down uh, with with the elders. Um, what were those sorts of things like? Uh, I'll look for this thing. But, uh, um, you know, because I, I attended some of those with the platoon leader and the company commander. Uh, in Paktika province at places like Yo Yosef Kel and Yaya Kel. And those seems, they seemed really productive, right? Like freedom was possible. These people were getting a sense of their own governance and, and things like cell phone towers and aqueducts and, you know, mm -hmm. educating the, the girls in their community. It just seemed like everything was possible and there was ground being made, but it was cyclic, right? Yeah. Um, so, a lot of that kind of stuff that I did was when I uh, went over to special forces and um, yeah, definitely had key leader engagements and, and engagements with the, the ISWAT team that I worked with and, and to offer um, and also just more informal engagements. Yeah. Sometimes meeting with elders, um, meeting with school children in, in one or two cases. Um, but it's all sort of like, they're, they're not, what am I, what, the term I'm looking for, vestigial, it feels like sand slipping through your fingers, right? Um, that you can feel like there's real progress being made, but at the same time, I mean, this, this, this country and this culture is what it is, and it has its own direction that is just so well beyond your control, um, maybe beyond your understanding. Um, and I, I think that was evidenced um, by the fact that, you know, we pulled out of there and within a few years, ISIS came to town and any semblance, I mean, if there's any question at all that what we did mattered, I, I think ISIS disabused us of that. And, and, and there's no way that you could possibly claim that, you know, our 10 years in Iraq was a success. You, Roger that. Um, and in, in some ways, um, even in 2010, like I'm talking about this cycle of winning and losing. And so if you're sitting down with uh, the two star at the Kayak, they're talking about SIG acts and, you know, these sort of metrics of atmospherics. Of, yes. And, and that and declaring victory against those metrics. Um, but then when you're out in the field and you see they own the night and the locals will vacillate into whoever is going to provide security for the next 12 hours. Sure. In terms of their allegiance and who they love and so forth and so on. Because um, when I was there in 2010, the Taliban were shutting down cell phone towers at night, mm -hmm. um, you know, just as a punitive measure. Um, and, and we had no way to remedy that uh, at, at the time. And, you know, two teens with AK-47s in, in some field would light off this chain of events on the American side that was pretty disproportionate, to put it mildly, right? So a SIGAC just meant there was a, a shot somewhere and, and uh, near a, a combat outpost. And so all of a sudden, Apaches, F-18s off of the carrier that's in the North Arabian Sea, um, you know, all kinds of drones, you know, satellites uh, in, in reaction to this teenager with a rifle, you know. And, and so you could tell that I don't know how we can sustain this. We fought both Iraq and Afghanistan in a uniquely American way, which is to say we threw a lot of stuff at the problem. Right. You know? So against an asymmetric threat, we create compounds. And the chaos that I sat in looked like NASA's mission control. I mean, huge screens and comfy chairs. And every an analyst was in front of a three screen, you know, sort of a computer setup and it was super air conditioned and really nice, you know, and then you get to the outpost and they're, they don't have running water and they're eating, you know, um, you know, cliff bars and, and uh, you know, what was that gel stuff that, you know, keep everybody yeah, rippets, rippets and, you know, that sort of stuff, you know, and Red Bull. Um, I lived on those things for six days and I'll tell you what, um, and I'm sure you can relate. 
Um, they start to taste like plastic after a while. You know, there's no like food taste to them. Um, and uh, so anyway, the, the point I'm making here is, um, you know, as you see it all implode with a guy that has skin in the game and blood and sweat and tears in the game, you lost folks in the pursuit of some measure of security, democracy, whatever the lofty tenants that sent you there. Um, you know, there's got to be a sense of frustration, but we're getting ahead of ourselves because I want to talk about that once you put on your journalist hat. Um, but let's talk about, because you've hinted a couple of times about your transition from ranger to special operator. What was that all about? So let's see, 2006, uh, or no, it was the last class of 2005. I went to the special forces assessment and selection, um, got selected and then, um, went to the Q course, the qualification course, which is like a year, year and a half of training. Um, I went there in 2006 and then graduated in 2007. So became a green beret at that point. Um, you know, for me, I mean, I was just ready for something new and different. Um, you know, deploying with Ranger Battalion was awesome. Um, but also I think during my fairly, you know, short time in Ranger Battalion, I, I also probably participated in the seizing of Lawson Airfield on Fort Benning, like, you know, a dozen times. Uh, <laughs> some of that shit gets old after a while and you're, you're ready to do something different. Um, so let, let's, uh, in terms yeah. of the nomenclatures, cause again, I want to make sure that, that I have this straight and, and my, uh, viewers have this straight. Um, so ranger, if you're a ranger, is that special forces? If I no. say, if, I, if I'm a no. ranger, like you're in a ranger battalion, is that special forces? No, that's, it's special operations. So Okay. Special operations command encompasses um, all four branches now. So there's Naval Special Warfare, Army Special Operations Command, Marine Special Operations Command, and Air Force Special Operations Command. And underneath all of those, each branch has their own units. So Air Force has the PJs. They have their combat controllers, all those guys. Army has Ranger Regiment, uh, Delta Force, Special Forces, the Green Berets, uh, and then PSYOPs and Civil Affairs. And then Navy, of course, has the SEALs and the special boat guys. Um, so that's like a very broad breakdown of what special operations encompasses. So that's, spe okay, again, I'm asking the difference between special forces and special operations. So did you just describe special forces or special ops? Special operations as a whole. And, okay, because you said special forces, but I think you meant to say oh, special operations. Yeah, yeah, special operations encompasses all of that. Okay. Um, so and, what is special forces then? So special forces is, is an, again, a specific army special operations unit. Um, the, you know, most people know them as green berets, uh, the operational element of special forces that, I mean, there are, uh, different groups that are assigned to different areas of the world. Um, so the operational element though, is a 12 man ODA or operational detachment alpha, um, that encompasses experts in communications, demolitions, weapons, um, and engineers. Um, and then there's an intelligence sergeant. There's a warrant officer who is the you know second in command, the captain who is in command of the ODA, and a team sergeant in a uh, E8. So the ODA is designed for unconventional warfare. Um, they're designed to be able to go behind enemy lines, train local forces. Um, but they have a number of different tasks. I mean, uh, uh, the, the more peacetime oriented mission is called foreign internal defense, where they will, instead of going behind enemy lines, they'll go to f uh, friendly countries and train that country's military in, you know, tactics, weapons, whatever we want them to know. Um, so, for instance, an ODA could go to like the Kingdom of Jordan. Um, and train with their military and, and get them up to speed or, or go down to Columbia and train Colombian Rangers and all these sorts of different things that, ha that happen. I mean, special forces deploys to probably like well over a hundred countries every year um, doing these types of missions. So uh, their wartime mission can be unconventional warfare, special reconnaissance, direct action. Um, uh, there's even like a, a counter narcotics, counter WMD mandate in there. Um, but, uh, it encompasses all of these different things. And I mean, if I were to point out, you know, the, I guess the main difference, 
um, between special forces and other elements, other special ops units, is that special forces really focuses on and they build themselves as America's premier partner force, that they are the guys that go and partner with our allied forces and train them, equip them, and, and can accompany them into combat if need be. Um, and to do that, they have a much bigger emphasis on you know cultural fluency and on foreign language capabilities than a lot of the other units have. So this is where you sat down with you know school kids and and you you kind of tried to immerse yourself in the culture uh, in a very insidious kind of way. <laughs> well, you uh, as they say, you meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. So. Um, if they, if they like to sit on the floor and drink chai tea, then that's what you do. Uh, if, uh, you, you know, it, it's, it, it's kind of adapting to whatever the local people are, whatever their customs are and, and trying to meet them at that point and then build rapport with them and build some sort of a relationship. So again, what I saw when I was embedded and, and attended some of those, um, gatherings of the tribal elders, uh, my sense was there was good work being done there. You know, the, they had, uh, in fact, I rode in an MRAP with the, uh, the battalion commander and the governor of Sharana from Sharana to uh, uh, Yayakel and sat down at Ashuria with the, the, the tribal elders, uh, along with the Angel Company commander, um, a VMI guy named Josh Powers, and West Point guy uh, named uh, Second Lieutenant, First Lieutenant, rather, Smith, um, and watched, you know, the look in the eye and the body language and the Terps were there, and those guys are fantastic. Um, one guy named Chewy particularly was an all-star, um, and that's why, and this is a separate t subject, but we need to get the folks at risk that served us well, like Afghan Air Force pilots and the interpreters, to the United States because they are at risk as they're holed up in uh, places like Islamabad and that sort of thing. Separate, separate subject, which I actually have an episode coming up on that. But uh, in any case, watching that, when you emerge from that and you jump back in the MRAP and you go back to the FOB, you're like, you know, I think a good thing just happened. Yeah. It seemed like they trust us. It seemed like what we're promising is taking, it has some traction here, you know? Well, you know, the locals on, on one hand, I think they very shrewdly understood how to play one party against the other. Um, and, you know, essentially playing both sides, looking to see who's going to give them a better deal. And as Americans, we can kind of sit back and judge that because, you know, we're sitting back here in America, right? You know, eating double stuff Oreos and stuffing a Big Mac in our face. But I mean, if you live in a country like Afghanistan or, or even Iraq, the people there have to choose their, you know, strategic partners. They they have to make these alliances to survive. I mean, it's a totally different game for them. And when America just kind of ups, pulls up stakes and leaves the country, all of these different parties, you know, tribe, family, military unit, whatever it is, um, they have to choose whatever side is going to give them the most survivability. So, I mean, you have to be careful about how much criticism you, you lob at them for doing that. Yeah, I remember some advice I was given uh, by a, a army vet um, on my way over there. He said, nothing is what it seems. <laughs> um, you know, so the, even the children with the Batman backpacks um, will, will look friendly um, and this kind of sounds Vietnam War esque, you know, uh, where it's like don't trust anybody. But like you said, they're they're working both ends against the middle. Um, I think there's something to their survival sense that they are conniving and they know what face to put on at any given time. In fact, I took a video of Josh Powers talking to um, the locals about an event that had happened the day before. And, and this is the other thing. I don't think you spent too much time in either of those countries, Iraq or Afghanistan, certainly during the years you served without seeing some stuff in a hurry. And so on day two of our time at Yosef Kel, the combat outpost at Yosef Kel, um, we saw a, an Afghan boy step on a landmine that was planted by um, the, the Taliban. And, and so what Josh is saying to the folks of 
of Yayakel, or I'm sorry, Mest. This was the village of Mest, uh, where what's his name wandered off. Who am I thinking of? Bergdahl. Yeah, well, where Bull Bergdahl had wandered off nine months prior to us being there. In fact, Josh Powers showed me where he wandered off and walked down the street. His last statement was, I'm looking for a party. Um, and so um, we're in Mest. And Josh is going, who does this? Talking about the Taliban. You know, who would put a landmine so that a teenage boy gets his leg blown off? And the interpreter is interpreting it. And and the locals are like, yeah, who does that? That's screwed up. Yeah. I mean, they're all like, yes, you're so right. You know, and you're like, oh, what he's saying is resonating. They're ready to take stock in their own protection and, you know, take up arms against the Taliban. But there's that was not even close to true. Right. Because as soon as the sun set and we wander back to the MRAPs and drive away, now they're like, you know, okay, what do we got to do to survive the night here without getting our throat slit or whatever? Right. So when you see that cycle, this is the long term point. It's like whenever we exited, you know, just the wheels going around, whenever we exit, the end state was clear, even to me in in 2010. You know, and there's no way short of I mean, you know, nation building is impossible but I like to, when people are like, oh, whatever the status of the war was, for me, I think you've described it in the kind of sort of granular way, which is for the guys who served, their senses, they did good work. Yeah. And, and that's why I think it's very frustrating when a lot of guys have, you know, we talk now about like moral injury and things like this, um, a, a lot of frustration. Um, and I think there's a need also for um, validation not like validation in the sense that like I as a veteran need to be individually validated as some sort of hero, but just a, uh, like a nationwide validation or recognition that this war took place. Uh, a lot of times it feels like a fever dream. And I, I even go to veterans events like big events sometimes. And uh, everyone loves to talk about the six, the first six months of Afghanistan, but it kind of ends there. The celebration ends there. And uh, I'll be sitting at these events, and you know what's one word that never, ever gets mentioned? Iraq. It's just memory hold. It's like it never even happened. And I, it's just very surreal to think about. Yeah, and that's being polite about it. Um, you know, it's like a Kipling poem at some level. Um, so let's let's pivot to your transition out of the military and, and how you decided to pursue a a career in in journalism sure i mean it was quite accidental i mean some of the the frustrations that we've been discussing um with how the war was going was something that i felt like as you mentioned in 2010 i thought it was pretty obvious that we weren't taking the war seriously and you know what the end state was going to be um so i got out of there um i i popped smoke in 2010 um didn't have much of a plan um, of what I did. I mean, I, I, I know I've told you this story before, Ward, but I'll, I'll bore your audience uh, quickly with this. I um, decided I wanted to write a novel, like a military fiction novel. And I started up like a little blog, like a word pl- WordPress blog to try to like support this book and get the word out. And uh, when I was doing that, someone at military.com reached out to me and asked if I would write the same tor- type of type of stuff that I was already writing about gear and weapons and things like that for military.com. I said, yeah, sure. So um, that was kind of how I took my uh, first step into the media, I guess you could say, and um, just kind of went from there. Um, I ended up getting involved in a startup company and uh, that, that specialized in special operations news and very quickly realized that meant I had to write news. <laughs> so um you know, the, the sort of uh, eventually doing investigative type journalism and also doing um, traveling overseas and doing kind of boots on the ground reporting from Kurdistan, from Syria, from the Philippines, a few other places. Um, that's kind of how that all came about. So the guy you're talking about at Military.com was Christian Lowe, mm-hmm. um, who I've remained uh, both close to as a friend, but he's been a colleague at a couple of different places. So when you were doing that, I was the editor. Christian was the managing editor. Um, he had a focus on gear and and weapons, and he mm-hmm. would go to SHOT Show every year. And, and, and so Christian also embedded with me in Afghanistan in 2010, and he had embedded a few times previous, particularly in, in Iraq. 
um, when he worked at Marine Corps Times as as one of the writers, uh, reporters at Marine Corps Times. So Christian was the first uh, reporter, original reporter that we brought aboard um, during my time as, as the editor. So you and I dealt with each other um, in, in a, a variety of ways during those years. Like you said, you were a blogger. That's when the mill blogosphere yeah. was was kind <laughs> oh of influential and, and huge, right? I mean, because this like is on citizen. CNN where they talk about the blogosphere, like what? Yeah, right. You know, and so <laughs> this is pre-social media, mm -hmm. um, and so a blog was ground truth, unfiltered truth. And so what we liked about it at military.com because we were sort of over leveraged at that time. And I won't bore you with the details of how military.com got itself in that position. Uh, but let's just say they were trying to keep the lights on when the dot-com bubble burst in early aughts. And so if, if your news reportage is just syndicated AP Reuters, when the war um, is starting to be less obvious, in terms of winning and losing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so the time we, we talked about, pre Anbar awakening, post invasion, sectarian violence, and you know, like it looks like we're losing, but bloggers were able to sort of thread the needle of, okay, there are some challenges, but you know, the US forces are still doing good work. And I'm gonna talk to you about my personal experiences and so forth and so on. So as uh, under the banner of military.com, that was very important content. And so Chris Michael, the founder of military.com, um, was very forward leaning and encouraged us to, you know, open the doors of military.com to mill bloggers. And, you know, we had various levels of success with, uh, you know, some mill bloggers thought they were the show, you know, and, oh, yeah. and so they're like, why do I need military.com? I already have a huge WordPress site and I get this number of page views. And everybody knew what their metrics were, you know, off the top of their head. Um, but you started with that and that got you into our umbrella and then you took it to the next level. Uh, in the meantime, you were pursuing your education as well. Mm -hmm. So tell us about, uh, how, how that went down. Yeah. I mean, during the time when I was trying to write this book, I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I enrolled in college. I did my first year in, um, Mercy uh, in Dobbs Ferry and then transferred to Columbia in, let's see, that must have been 2012? No, 2011, because I graduated in 2014. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I was a full-time student at Columbia during, during this time period, trying to do all, juggle all these different things. So here's an interesting comment, because this is a name I haven't heard from a, for a long time. So Alfa Romeo 15 says, you need to bring on Michael Yan and get his perspective. Do we know whatever happened to Michael Yan? Um, I, uh, I had some like brief interactions. I mean, he started talking to me when he started talking to me about how he was chasing cannibals in China. I kind of cut like, okay, I'm <laughs> have, have fun with that. Um, Cause I'm he was, he was the kid. Him. He was the kid in this early phase, right? He had some amazing photos. Yeah. He had some great reporting. Um, his blog was, was really, really important in those days. And, and then perhaps uh, let's just say there was some shark jumping along the way um, perhaps. Um, but that's a name alpha Romeo one five that I haven't heard for a long time, but it evokes this era. We're talking about the, yeah. the pioneers of the mil yeah. military reporting space. Mm-hmm. So you get your degree, like you say, at college. Well, it was Columbia, right? And there was kind of a cohort of military veterans at Columbia in those days. Oh, they yeah. went on to do a bunch of things, <laughs> right? They're in New York. Um, now, did you use your GI Bill to get your degree? Yes. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I, and I used it. Believe me, I used all of it. The GI Bill, post 9-11 GI Bill, the Yellow Ribbon Program, the Pell Grant, state tuition assistance. Uh, and I still cash, I think I cashed in like ten thousand dollars in um in uh in bonds, and then I think I went like twenty three thousand dollars in debt. <laughs> what? How did that happen? 
Yeah. So yes, I used the 911 GI Bill and then some. Yeah. So that was a great benefit. You know, oh, so yeah, if, we, if we did right by huge. our war fighters post 911, it's amazing. That's it. yeah. So that's Jim Webb. That's Paul Rykoff and IAVA did good work in those days. Um, who was his ledge affairs guy? I'm blanking on his name. He's a great, great guy. Worked closely with Webb's office. Um, it's funny because um, Senator McCain, who's a controversial figure uh, on this channel, I, I talk about him as an aviator. And when, every time I do, I, I get flame sprayed by um, folks who are high and right about his existence. Um, but he opposed that GI Bill because he said, how are we going to pay for it? And his military advisor guy uh, was a classmate of mine or is a classmate of mine who I remember talking to him at uh, the Navy Notre Dame game in, in Baltimore. And he's like, Hey, how are we going to pay for it? I'm like, I don't know, but it seems like it's a cool benefit and people are going to use it in a good way. And I know that Senator Webb is very keen on it and, and so forth and so on. But I just thought it was interesting. There's always a negative to any initiative, but I think ultimately this played out to be a fantastic, not unlike the first GI bill after world war II that paid for, basically every fat cat for the next 50 years, that's where they got their start. They served in World War II. They got their education. They went on to create, you know, the greatest country on the face of the earth. Yeah. The, the post nine 11 GI bill, I mean, it, it, there's a, a housing allowance. Um, so they're, they're basically paying you to go to school. Um, there's a, there's like a book allowance. I mean, there's all kinds of different things in there. Um, in the army or the military in general, I should say they've gotten a lot better with like, sort of like job training for guys. There's a whole transition program for that. Um, they, they've done, they've definitely made a lot of progress in that regard. So you mentioned some of your early assignments, you know, you're always running to the sound of gunfire. So you're now a journalist. In fact, I got a super cool picture of you with your journalist hat on. Although you don't have a hat on, let me find this picture. Here we go. That's that's pretty badass. That's in uh. That's Notice in, the Siggy. You you got a Siggy going on there. Yeah, I smoked um, at that time. Yeah. Uh, that was Northwest Syria. Um, during the during the Civil War, it was that was early on too. That was like 2014. Um, that I went over there. So who were you working for in that in that capacity? That you <laughs> I was working create? for a little startup website that, you know, I had no top cover whatsoever. Um, I didn't even I know that much about journalism. Um, so it was really just like and, and I mean, it really was winging it. I was out there flapping. Um, I used what connections I had and was able to make and got smuggled into Syria um, with the, the PKK actually smuggled us across the border. Um, me and a couple other journalists, and we were over there for you know a couple weeks. So, in some ways, your capacity as a military journalist is even more risky, hairy than oh, your yeah. Yeah. time as a special <laughs> as a Green Beret or a Ranger. It was it was like Robin Sage, like the 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 training exercise that you do, unconventional warfare training exercise. I mean, getting like you know, linking up with the auxiliary and then they drive you up into the mountains and you go to this like guerrilla camp where all the huts are like camouflaged into the side of the mountain and you go inside and there's all the like different flags of the different Kurdish movements, Kurdish independence movements. And you one by one shake hands with all the people in the camp. I mean, that's, that's straight out of Robin Sage. So did you leverage that training to keep your head in those environments? I mean, it was certainly helpful in the sense that like it helped me, I, like I wasn't surprised or I, I I was like, oh, I recognize this. This is exactly what I was trained to do. You know, it, it was helpful in that regard. Um, but I mean, listen, there's no air support. There's no medevac. There's I mean, if you get into trouble, you are on your own, like you are out there flapping. And so it's exhilarating in the sense that you're like living by your wits and you're having to negotiate your own way and figure out everything on your own. Um, uh, I mean, doing that type of journalism, doing it that way, this was not embedded journalism. This was uh, just out there winging it. Um, and I, I mean, yeah, that, that's inherently <laughs> very dangerous in a war zone. So I, I think what we started to realize at that time was the, the paradigm was shifting rapidly in terms of who was a real journalism outfit and, and so forth and so on. And I think at military.com, we started to realize that if we 
through the right talent at a situation, we could break down walls. Sure. On the public affairs side, would normally they'd be like, well, you're not the Washington Post, you're not the New York Times. No. And then when they saw the impact that we had and people stopped being uh, sort of brand loyal, they were sort of brand agnostic. So you're out there, right. you're having uh, interfaces, you're you're discovering things that other stringers or other major news organizations aren't. And so now in this digital landscape, uh, consumers are starting to realize, hey, ground truth doesn't come from traditional sources, you know. Um, and I think the, the best example of this is you scored an interview with President Assad. Um, so t- talk to us about that. How did that happen? And, and what was that like? Well, yeah, I mean, in fairness, there was in the room with me uh, a journalist from The New Yorker and a journalist from The New York Times. Um, and we were just part of a very small group that was selected for this. Um, but I mean, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And when you hear people talk about, well, like, oh, that isn't the New York times. Well, they, they just sound like a dinosaur at this point. I mean, and for the reader, I mean, that stuff doesn't matter to them. Like who's on the byline. Um, you know, is it, is it this, is it that, I mean, those are like inherently very elitist conversations that the average American just has no interest in whatsoever. Um, but as far as, um, Assad, that that was my second trip to Syria. And that was um, so the first trip was uh, allegedly an illegal border crossing. But the the second trip was um, at the invitation of the Syrian government. So in that case, um, I flew into Beirut and took a bus across the border to Syria and then onwards to Damascus. And it was part of, uh, I mean, it was a bus, it was a, literally a busload of journalists um, and think tank people and some other colorful characters. And this was part of the regime ostensibly trying to open up to the West, to open up to Western journalism and have some sort of uh, transparency. I mean, that, that was how, how it sold anyway. Um, so we were brought in and um, there was a, uh, it was a seminar event where you would go in every day um, to this big uh, auditorium in Damascus and uh, they would have lecturers and panels and stuff like that. And some of them were okay. Some of them were surreal. Um, some of them were just, you know, bizarre propaganda. Um, it, so it really ran the gamut. Um, but then uh, on one of these days, I was taken aside by one of the event organizers and they're like, well, yeah, uh, tonight you're going to go up to the palace and you're going to uh, have an interview with President Assad. I'm like, huh. OK. Sounds good. So, <laughs> so I mean, what was what was it like? Was he candid? Was it weird? Did he? You know, was it cryptic? What, what, not, what was not, that? Not, not, not weird. Not, not probably what you expect. Um, I took a car ride up to the, I believe it's the summer palace that's up in the hills. Um, came out and uh, went, walked into the foyer and uh, there was a uh, minder there um, who, you know, after a few moments, she said, okay, you can now proceed up the steps and uh, meet President Assad. And I figured we're going to go up there and get a briefing on like etiquette or some, you know, something like that. Right. So I start walking. I'm the first one. I start walking up the steps. And as I'm like halfway up, I hear, good evening. Hello. And I look up and there's President Assad. And I shook his hand and walked the rest of the way up the steps. And we went into a little office and sat down and did the interview. And, um, you know, no, it's, it's not, it's not, it was not odd or, or creepy or, or maybe what people imagine. I mean, he's a very personable guy. Um, he has a lot of interests, I think, outside of government. Um, we had, I I mean, it's a, appears to be a, a fairly candid conversation. I thought there was nothing that was like off limits. Um, so in some ways it's a frustrating conversation. Um, but you know, you have to understand that president Assad is sort of the outward facing public messenger of the regime. Um, and so he's very polished. His English is quite good. Um, and he has answers to, to the questions that you're going to ask now, you know, is uh, there, are, there are value judgments to be made? Uh, you know, is Assad a dictator? Is he a war criminal? I mean, these are all like important conversations to be had. But well, the, the, the other thing at the time you interviewed him, this is before 
this is early on in the conflict. And, this is and 2017. And the other things, the, the, the chemical attacks, that sort of stuff came. Some of them, some later. of them had happened. I mean, this is 2017 by now. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. The barrel so, bombing. I mean, all that stuff was, the yeah. Russians were already there. Okay. Okay. So did that come up in conversation at all? you like, sir, did you, what do you think about, you know, chemical attacks on your own, citizens that kind of was that part of the conversation or was that yeah, there, there was some conversation about you know are you you know are you a war criminal like how does that how does that sit with you um there were conversations um it was um it was actually in bernard at the new york times i'm um, really asking a lot of questions about you know people being tortured in government prisons and he was in he totally denied that and said you know where's your evidence do you have evidence do you have evidence and you know, I think uh, several years later, you know, Anne published a story and she did have evidence. Uh, she developed that story quite a bit. So um, I think it, it was probably a frustrating conversation in, 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 in some of those regards. But I mean, Assad, you know, very much like plowed right through those questions um, without any sort of hesitation. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's an amazing audience that you got there um, at that time. So um you continued to develop your resume as a military journalist. Um, and, you know, we worked with you a, a bunch during the, the, the years I was at military.com. Um, and then you became part of another startup um, that was a special forces focus um, kind of a thing. Um, and, and so let's talk about the, the, the balance of your, you know, military journalism career, up to the point that you start doing the, the team house part of that, that, uh, uh, um, brand. Uh, so, I, I mean, you're also, you got a million irons and a million fires sure. and, and yeah. what the, I think any aspiring journalist, military or otherwise need to understand that, uh, you know, to, to make this a viable occupation, um, you need to be both agile and, uh, and able to jump on opportunities, uh, you know, you change your jersey a lot, let's say. I guess being a baseball player is kind of a rough analogy. Just watch Moneyball again the other night, um, which I always love the way that these players are always either getting sent down or traded or so forth and so on. Uh, there's no job security. And that's kind of like being a military journalist. And uh, I think yeah, we've talked about the pioneer um, years of military journalism. And you're one of the sort of standard bearers for that first wave of war fighters that aspired to do sort of things that there was no path, there was no pipeline yeah. for what, what you chose to do. Um, there was a sense that you could be good at it and it, it could be a way to make a living. Um, and, and so you just I kept mean, going. There, there's also a sense that like, if you have the balls, you can make your own way in this line of work. You know, it, there it is sort of a uh, a libertarian, you know, anarchic <laughs> sort of a model of journalism that like anyone can participate. And if you can perform, if you can get some big scoops, if you can report accurately and succinctly, um, if you're willing to go overseas and report from combat zones, if you're willing to do things that perhaps you know more established or legacy journalists aren't willing to do. Um, you can make your way and you can develop some sort of a niche in this, in this line of work. And I mean, it's a great, great job. I love this job, but good Lord, it's a terrible industry. <laughs> it's just a horrible industry. So this is a conversation we had on your channel uh, at the team house. Um, and let, let's, let's delve in. Sure. Now talking about how the media landscape has changed better mm. for worse. Um, what are some initial thoughts about that? Well, yeah, I don't know if I'm even qualified to, to speak about the media writ large, right? Um, but I'll, I'll just speak from like my personal experience. Um, when I started writing and when I started doing this, there was no one else, not, not, even setting journalism aside, there is no other like special ops war on terror guys in the media at all. I think maybe Tim Kennedy actually may have been the only person you really saw out there. Um, and I remember that quite specifically. And I understood that what I was doing was breaking the rules. 
it was breaking sort of like the the unwritten rules of special operations that you don't talk. Um, you certainly don't become a journalist and start like airing dirty laundry in public, right? I understood that I was breaking a lot of norms. Um, and I and I did that knowingly and I did it intentionally. I was I was prepared to break some glass. Um at that time, yeah, there there was nothing else out there like it. And and to this day, there's still a, a, a void. Um, there's a lot of like national level reporting, but there's still to this day, not a lot of reporting of like, you know, soldiers entered and cleared a building. What happened inside that room? There's still not a lot of reporting along those lines. Um, but what, what changed from, you know, I was, I was very much an M, you know, I suppose a product of the 2010s digital media environment, you know, whether I like it or not, I, I existed in that world, um, and grew out of it. Um, since that time, I mean, social media came around and, and I, I would argue that it did change a lot of the things that I've been talking about here. Um, previously the only online presence of special ops was like a couple like weird message boards where like some old guys would hang out and basically talk about how shitty all the young people are and, and bad mouth people who want to join special ops. Um, they, they were kind of like the internet gatekeepers. And then, you know, the next wave in the 2010s kind of washed them away and made them completely irrelevant from that perspective. Um, and then in the, as we get into, uh, you know, the, the social media error, what happens is that you have all these, um, you know, global war on terror veterans, special operations and others jumping on social media. And they're using that as a platform to begin telling their story, good, bad, or indifferent, whatever you think about it. They're starting to post pictures from their deployments. They're starting to talk about their experiences. They're starting to get out there. And they're also, some of them are starting to write books. They're starting to do podcasts. And so the environment drastically shifts where you had these, these kind of strange web forums you know, into in the 1990s, into the 2000s, you get into the 2010s and you get like websites like the ones I worked for in mill bloggers or military journalists, if you want to call it that. And then eventually they get displaced by social media. And from my point of view, they, they, the, that type of reporting um, largely got displaced by, you know, veterans joining social media. Well, if you think about just the user experience, circa mid aughts, right? Where it was a homepage mattered, right? right? He would stress <laughs> about tier one nav, tier two nav, how big, how big should the logo be? Um, Pop-ups, yep. um, you know, people would bookmark along the top of your browser, um, you know, and, and, and that was the end, that was the way into information, <laughs> right? You know, so what you aggregated under the news feed or the news tier one channel vertical mattered a lot. And now that's inconsequential. It's just like my homepage for my YouTube channel. If you look at the metrics, nobody goes there. And I stress about, you know, what do the thumbnails look like all aggregated? And am I using the real truth or deep Intel too often, but that's not anybody's entry point into my content. Right. And so when you talk about the way that people get informed and how do you stay informed in a, in a balanced way these days, um, it's completely inside out. So we were talking about, okay, homepage, and then you drill down and you get to an article and that would tell you what you wanted to know. Now you see the article first because it's either on your Facebook or your threads or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or whatever. And then you go, maybe you click into it and you arrive at a landing page that's on a website. And maybe there's some other thumbnails or links that, that allows you to migrate around that website, but then you back out back to your social media feed. Yeah. And so yeah. it's completely different. But I, again, you and I were people first don't care years. about the outlet. They don't care about the yeah. byline. They're not interested in that. Yeah. Right. All they and they just care about facts, right? And that's the other thing that the just like if you look at the the comments thread that's going on right now, that has little to nothing to do with our discussion, by the way. Um, but you know these guys are keeping each other honest, you know. Um, and there was a Russian bot that I had to like put into the penalty box while we're talking here. But um, you know, it's uh, let me just say it's self policing. Same with comment sections at any outlet 
And same with your feed at any, your, your social media ch- uh, site of choice. So at some level, the role of editors is less policing facts than it is just keeping the trains running or based on what the feedback loop is telling them, reacting, you know? And, and so that's a complete change from when, it, when you know, we were doing our thing initially. I'd be, I'd be kind of curious to hear your thoughts too, Ward, of like, I, I'm I'm definitely of the impression that, well, things are certainly still changing. And I, I'm wondering if we're going into now in the 2020s, we're going into the next iteration of whatever this is going to be. Um, is that uh, is that like uh, Gen 2 social media or is it something else? Because, I mean, Facebook was a thing when I started off. That was like an important platform to be on and to use. Now it's completely useless. Like right. it, it's archaic. There, and, and I go on there and it's so there's so much garbage on there. I don't even know how to use the platform anymore. Um, Twitter seems like it's going by the wayside quite quickly. You mean X? Not <laughs> right. Twitter, right. So, um, um, you know, me and uh, my colleague, uh, Sean Naylor, we're on Substack and uh, we write special ops news on there. Some really big investigative stories. Um, and I, I really like that platform, but I don't know. I, I'm not, uh, you know, smart enough to be able to say that's the future of journalism. I don't know that. I mean, where do, what do you see as like being maybe the next step? So I, I, I think it's changing so rapidly, even as we speak, right? You said yeah. Twitter and Twitter no longer exists. Now it's X. Um, and I think people thought that the momentum was shifting back towards the Facebook, the meta body of properties, and that they'd scored this coup with threads. But the UX of threads is terrible, you know, and, and the things like that make using Twitter fun and informative like gifs and widgets that could allow you to auto populate your twitter feed don't exist in threads because although they built it on the instagram they're they're big ideas to load me and you into the metaverse and we're gonna wear these goggles oh hey there ward oh yeah like who thinks this is a good idea it doesn't replicate the the twitter you user experience so as a result it's going to fail so they had an initial surge of Millions of, you know, signups, but the daily usage has gone plummeted, you know, and I know they're probably freaking about that. And uh, Zuckerberg's probably jumping up and down on his product team's heads. But um, in any case, what I think of, and this is, this is how unorthodox the veteran media space has been. You know, we think of, you know, the, the, the guys we know, some of them have gone into traditional media like Jim Laporta um, mm-hmm. and, and guys like that. Um, some have kind of been hybrids like Paul Zoldra, you know, who created Duffel Blog, worked with me at We, we Are the Mighty, went on to be the editor of Task and Purpose, and now has gone uh, to the other side of the aisle and, and uh, works on the defense contractor side. Um, and, and then there's others who have forged a path of perhaps the highest impact, but under this sort of entertainment brand or, mm. uh, you know, merchants of like t-shirts and and coffee right so black rifle coffee company matt best and and those guys uh nick at ranger up um you know nine line all all of these companies that basically started as uh grunt style um that started as t-shirt companies and then they become they use the social media as a way to promote the product and then they just become their own like social media entities, particularly Matt Best. And Matt's a super cool guy. Uh, I, I work with him a bunch when we were at We're the Mighty out in LA. Um, in fact, I'm an extra in, uh, in, in Range, what's the name of that movie? Range um, 15, right? Uh, and, and so uh, it's when I was working in LA and they're like, hey, come on out, you guys can be in the movie. Um, so, you know, got to be very close to JT and Matt and, 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 and all the gang there. And Black Rival Coffee Company was just starting up at that time. Um, and, and so Evan and those guys, we, we got to know them as well. So these guys are entrepreneurs with a capital E. You know, um, that where they've succeeded is not easy. But what they the aha moment was we can use things like YouTube to entertain and delight a mm-hmm. constituency, you know, aggregate and proliferate that that audience, and then we can transact and 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 you know sell them stuff. So whether it's coffee, t-shirts, a movie, 
whatever. But in the process, they become influencers. And I don't mean influencers like a Kim Kardashian kind of way, but I mean influencers in what is your political outlook, even on the margins. And I don't think. But you know, they've, obviously- I, I mean, they've also moved on to like their second wave, like they're like act two, right? Because I mean, you don't see like Matt Best in the media anymore. You don't see those dudes like doing that kind of stuff. And I don't know what they're doing, but presumably they're like, uh, like uh, Nick at Ranger Up. Also another guy, he's moved on, like they're, they matured, you know, as I hope we all do. Um, and like moved on to like their second act. I mean it in a good way. That, yeah, like, yeah, you're they, right. They you're right. And so they have, the they have thing. podcasts, they have, like Paul started a basically media company mm-hmm. um, that is anchored by a Paul, Paul Rykoff. I mean, um, and, and uh, you're right. So again, these guys are, are entrepreneurs. So this is what informed their success as, as, you know, leaders in the military, both enlisted and, and on the officer side um, that were, you know, showed courage under fire, did the right stuff, always gravitated like you towards, you know, tier one special ops or other things. They didn't want to be in the rear with the gear. That's the other thing. They're all highly credible in terms of what did you do, daddy, when you were in the war? It's like, well, I killed bad guys. You know, what else you want to talk about? Right. And so um, that is what was the sort of root note. And so when they go out and they make, you know, videos, you know, two minute videos of them shooting machine guns in the desert with like rat patrol and, and chicks and bikinis or whatever, you know, it's like they're, they have the cred to do that. And then, Oh, by the way, they are business people in, in the, the highest, most serious sense of the word, you know? And again, I, I, I think, I think we've all had to like grow up past some of that stuff though, because well, they, I, mean, the, I the, concur. The, the, the war was look for me, it was 13 years ago. I'm not getting any younger here. I just turned 40 this month. So, I mean, that that kind of stuff, I mean, it's fun to reflect back on and talk about a little bit, but it's not really relevant to, to anything beyond my personal experience anymore. Um, and I, I mean, I, I just think like, I, I mean, I don't mean this like in a negative negative or a derogatory manner. I just think like I, as I look around at all these personalities, I see that they've all kind of like grown up and matured in different ways. And the that type of media stuff that we were all doing 10 years ago doesn't seem so relevant anymore now um it, it's like it's moving on to something else well and plus there's a shelf life to our experience right yeah and so yeah, uh, yeah you know i mean the wars that you fought not to mention the the war between the wars that i fought fought um ww cold war and we won that one god damn it um you know the folks out there now were like hey grandpa i get it but i'm you know, on the front right. lines of this NATO thing, right? I'm in, right. I'm, I'm in the Adriatic or the Ionian Ionian Sea doing eight hour sorties trying to keep the Russians from coming west, or I'm sailing through the Straits of Taiwan, you know, on the small boy. This is the stories I'm hearing. Yep. I'm like, bro, Austin, it's great to hear that you're doing what you trained to do. You're leading a life of the greatest consequence. So, what do you need my sea stories for? You don't, yep. right? And that's the good news. And so I think to your point, you know, the the Ranger Up gang and the and the the BRCC dudes that started as Article 15 guys, you know, that had a shelf life. They're smart enough to see that we're running out of knots here, you know, um, being the wacky shoot rifles in the desert guys has a time and a place. But now we better triangulate this into something that has, a, you know, right. a staying power. And I think in the case of, of the BRCC guys, when you look who's involved, it is all the the, uh, the Article 15 guys, right? Except for Evan, who founded it. And, and so there's a media arm. Our good friend Marty Scovland is one of their main reporters there, and he does fantastic work. And so they have various divisions within this company that really makes vet influencers maybe some of the most important folks in America right now. And I think to your point, people miss that, that, that reality, you know, and, and what have the, the war, the post 9-11 war veterans gone on to do in some cases, it's guys um, uh, like, uh, who am I thinking of that uh, Massachusetts congressman who worked for Petraeus as a Marine. Sorry. 
Um, somebody in chat, tell me who I'm talking about. Um, you know, so they, either they've gone into politics or they've been uh, in think tanks um, and, uh, you know, or they've gone into the, the business space or the media space uh, in, in a variety of ways. So the impact is huge. And I think in some ways, um, this, this generation, which is, I guess you'd say millennials who went to war, um, who felt in a sense uh, betrayed by the motivation behind invading Iraq, particularly. This is where, um, you know, Phil Carter and um, Matt Slavin and Tammy Duckworth and all of these people mm. who I met at the convention in Denver in 08. Um, and I was, I just remember thinking in earlier eras, all of these people would have been Republicans, you know, and, and here or you know, moderate Republicans and here they're kind of moderate to progressive Democrats. I just remember that struck me very profoundly. And uh, so that's what has informed certainly the DC ecosystem. You know, and again, I'm talking think tanks, staffers, the talking heads you see on TV, um, you know, all of these kinds of folks. Uh, but again, I, I look, I just saw JT on a, a podcast uh, or a YouTube uh, uh, thing. My son loves, uh, he's a, my son is a bow hunter and he loves uh, the, those. Seth Moulton, thank you. That's exactly what I'm thinking of. Seth Moulton is, is who I meant to say. So Seth Moulton was a single Marine downrange with uh, the, during the Anbar Awakening with a bat phone that went right to Petraeus, you know? And, and so I know a lot of people like to present, paint him as a progressive, but the dude was a badass during the war in Iraq, make no mistake. And I've met him and, and got to know him pretty well. Um, he's a, a great American. Um, and I'll go to the mat over that. Um, but he's a good example of that era that pivoted into politics, you know, and I keep waiting for these folks to step up on a national level and kind of kick the oldsters out. I, you know, I, I, I'm just waiting for a millennial or even uh, Gen Z to to step up there. I mean, I don't know what Gen X is going to do, but we got to get us boomers out of the equation, please. Not to mention, um, you know, pre boomers that that are in the mix. Uh, so that's a whole other conversation. So, talk to us about the team house. How did this come about, and uh, uh, what are some of the highlights of what you guys have done besides the episode you did with me? <laughs> it's a, another one of those things that came about somewhat unexpectedly. I mean, I left the, the, the startup company that I was working for, I left abruptly. Um, you know, I stuck around for quite a while, you know, because I was kind of like co-founder and kind of had an emotional attachment to it. But when the CEO is a lunatic, there's only so much you can do, right? So eventually I had to step away. That was like four or five years ago. Um, the, I think literally the day I did that, um, I had a, I was trying to start up another company that, uh, in a totally unrelated field, but I had all this camera equipment and live streaming gear and everything in a studio I was setting up. And I was like, well, what do you know? I can, I can launch right back into what I do. And, um, so I think it was like that very next day I did the first episode of the team house, which like when all these live streams or a podcast start, um, they're like kind of a joke <laughs> in the beginning because you don't know what you're doing. Um, so it took a little while for us to get, uh, up and running, right. Um, COVID hits. We're fortunate that because it's a live stream, we can do these things remotely and continue to build the business. Um, we had a producer come on. It was me and my co-host Dave Park. Um, you know, it was just us. Then a producer comes on, uh, D who's been huge for helping us grow. Last summer, we moved into a bigger studio. We built out new sets, um, kind of redid things. And now this summer, I'm kind of like doing some more work down there to reset things again for the fall. Um, and we've just kind of built and built and built interview by interview. We just did episode 223 last night. Um, and I mean, we've had some, I mean, we've had big guests and, and less lesser known guests. I mean, which is kind of intentional. I love to interview people who don't normally do interviews. Um, but we've had all the way up to the former secretary of defense on the show too. Um, we do a lot of special ops guys. We do a lot of intelligence community people, some federal law enforcement, um, all kinds of different stuff, counterintelligence, 
um, you know, uh, guys who is uh, a Marine in, in Afghanistan or an 82nd Airborne guy in Iraq. But it's a heavy emphasis on special ops and the intelligence community, uh, I would say. That's kind of like been our wheelhouse. But you do. It's a Renaissance sort of brand and that you guys go all kinds of places that are CIA analysts, of, undercover yeah. ATF agents. Yeah. yeah. And the other, the other thing that you guys are good at is letting the conversation simmer. Um, and I think if you're, you know, if the listener slash viewer is willing to just sort of sit back for deep immersion on uh, the topic, then, then that's, that's the place to go. So again, the podcast slash YouTube channel is the team house. Uh, Jack and uh, his co-host Dave uh, do a fantastic job there. Um, they have the comfy couches and they smoke cigars and drink scotch up there in Brooklyn, um, right across the Williamsburg Bridge. I, I was supposed to go there in person. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out. Hey, then the next time. time you're in town, let us know, man. We'll yes. uh, we'll we'll have some stogies. Yes, I, I'm there. I'm I'm so there. So you you I'm going to take you up on that, please. Um, Jack's book, Murphy's Law, came out uh, a few years ago. It's a fantastic read. I've reread it a couple of times uh, prepping for my appearance on their channel and, and this conversation. It's fantastic. So if you haven't read Murphy's Law, check it out. Action packed. Also, Jack, as you saw here, is uh, a, an intelligent, erudite gent. Uh, and so when <laughs> he you. opines on something, it's worth noting. Uh, so Jack, love you, brother. Uh, thanks for spending some time with me today. And I hope our paths cross again very soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ward. All right. All right. That'll do it for this episode. Thanks to everybody. We had a, a, a smallish audience today, but uh, appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Hopefully you enjoyed an unorthodox look at uh, another side of the combat element, the Ranger special ops, Greenberry sniper part. And as you can see, Jack's a, an amazing guy. So as always, if you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything. If you'd like to help support the channel, as some of you did with the Super Chat, you can use the Super Thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And as always, in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. We have some cool episodes coming up uh, in a few days, so, so stay tuned. All right, you guys. Thanks.